إن الحمد لله وحده ليس له أنداد ولا قرائن فله الشكر الدائم على كل ما هو قائم من المصائب والكرائم ونصلي ونسلم صلاة وتسليما على نبيه القاتم صلى الله عليه وسلم We begin with praise and gratitude because that is the essence of what it means to be a believer. And at the end of the day, the whole reality is to recognize our imperfection and the perfection that brought us into existence. The closer we get to Him, the imperfections are purified from us. That is the nature of this life. So gratitude is the key to fortitude. Right now we're watching hurricanes, disasters, wars, genocide. We're seeing all of this. And now this huge earthquake that just hit in Iran and Iraq. 400 some people are dead. As a person of scripture, we have to take a step back and look at these things with spiritual insight. To look at these things with an eye of understanding. This is our role. You see the atheist doctrine, it tells us, if you claim that God is loving and merciful and good, then how are all of these terrible things happening? How is there wars and earthquakes and hurricanes and death and destruction and disease and sadness and sickness? Where is your loving, merciful, good God? The answer is actually very simple. Their problem is, is that they don't respect theology on its terms. They don't even believe in it, and yet they want to create a theology to disbelieve it. This is what's happening. The ultimate truth is, let's just get a little bit philosophical for a moment. If everything was perfect, how would we appreciate that it was perfect? It would just be the way things always are. You see what I'm saying? The only way you can appreciate something beautiful is that you have seen something ugly. The only way you can appreciate something good and fulfilling is because you have dealt with bad things that give you anguish and annoyance. You can only be truly happy if you have been sad. And at the end of the day, what we know from our scripture is, and I'm pretty sure all religions are in agreement, this was not meant to be heaven, nor are things other than God, the divine perfect. This is the theology that exists in all religions. The atheists are making up a false religion to disbelieve in it. The reality is, is that we must come to realize what makes our heart beat. What brought us into existence. What is behind all of this beautiful, complex system of creation that we see and experience and live in. When we see our own imperfections, we go to Him and it's natural. It makes perfect sense and it's easy. So that is this two halves of what it means to have faith in God and understand the reality of life, is that you must come to realize And if you try to count all of the favors that God has blessed you with, from your existence until now and at this moment, you will not be able to count. You will find yourself counting and counting and realizing. That's the standard. The exception to that norm is a hardship or an affliction. Something that gives you difficulty. Here, the natural response of people is to go to Allah Help me. The test is 
Will you go to him when things are going your way, realizing who made you in the situation you're in that you're so comfortable with? That's where the real test is. I've been in countries where there's lots of Muslims all over the place. You'll find that when poverty is more common, they're gravitating more towards God and remembrance of religion and purpose like that. But the more rich they get, the more they feel self-sufficient and the less spiritual they are. You find this as a big test. So, in pondering on this earthquake, there was not an earthquake in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. We saw that in the time of Umar anhu, one day he was awoke to an earthquake. Umar's reaction عنه, was to be very upset and concerned about the state of his people. That's how his concern. He was like, what have we done? That God is punishing us. Why are we not having the preservation of God? We need to look at our spirituality and exert effort. So that's a natural response historically in the Eastern world. Without the knowledge of science and things like this. But it is true that a Muslim realizes, mentioned in the Qur'an, things that happen similar to big earthquakes and the sun going away and being ripped apart, huge, amazing disasters that will be the call to the Day of Judgment. So when these things happen, someone who truly believes in the Day of Judgment will take serious <coughs> review of themselves. If this earthquake hit me right now and I die, am I ready for that? Am I ready to be buried in the ground and await for that trumpet to be blown and then the sun to be ripped apart and the mountains to become dust and then to, for us to be raised again? Am I ready for that? So when you hear about these calamities, you must think about your closeness to God. You must remember that in these earthquakes, in these hurricanes, in these people who are just go minding their business in their church, you never know when someone's going to come kill you or when some disaster will come take you. Many people from children, teenagers, young adults and elderly were killed in all of these things. None of those people the day before it happened were planning for that to happen. So the essence of what Umar anhu is saying is remind yourself about where you stand spiritually. When you hear about these afflictions, go out, give some more charity. Read some more Qur'an. Review your character. Call your parents. Go be with them. Show them kindness, love, care, and concern. Take care of your neighbors. All of the things that it means to be close to God and shining His light. You must emphasize that because maybe your time will come tomorrow. That's what the lesson is. And that's the lesson in the famous ayah from Surah Yunus. وَإِذَا مَسَّ الْإِنسَانَ الضُّرُّ دَعَانَا بِجَنْبِ قَائِمًا أَوْ قَاعِدًا فَلَمَّا كَشَفْنَا عَنْهُ ضُرَّهُ مَرَّ كَأَنْ لَمْ يَدْعُنَا إِلَى ضُرٍ مَسَّ And when affliction befalls a human being, the general standard, even with atheists, you will see it. They will start to call upon God while they're laying down in their bed, when they're sitting down with people, when they're standing up, they're calling upon divine support. They're invoking the Almighty. You will find this. But then God says, and here's where the point comes where we're sitting in Charlotte, North Carolina, at present time, we're living in bliss. Compared to most people on planet Earth, we're living in heaven over here. So patience isn't too much of our calamity. It is gratitude that will lead to a different understanding of patience and fortitude and perseverance.
Because he says, and then when we remove that calamity answering their prayers, the person acts like everything's fine and now they can just go back to their same old ways without spiritual devotion, without a realization of the one that blessed them with the state they were comfortable with before the calamity and the one that just now removed that calamity to remind him that this is the source of your favors. This is the reality. For us, it is gratitude. And there are many other ayahs on this point. Gratitude is the key to patience. When we say patience, sabr, it means fortitude, it means perseverance, it means forbearance, it means many things. So, in this modern secular hamster wheel of capitalism we are all living. Many people want to make an excuse. Why don't I give more wealth? Why don't I attend more programs? Why don't I seek to gain more spiritual knowledge? Why don't I embrace that spiritual path? Well, you know, I'm busy. I'm busy right now. With what? With my worldly um, responsibilities. I have work. And then at home I have a satellite dish. So we have to be very careful about what we're doing with our lives. Because we're living in a state where gratitude would mean to realize all the favors that have been given to us. So the scholar said the difference between hamd and shukr when it's relating to God, it's pretty much the same thing when it comes to the tongue. And hamd and shukr is to say, you have blessed me and favored me and given me so much. فَلَكَ الْحَمْدِ Like in a shukr, Al-amal bil lisan wa jawari. Shukr comes out as an active lifestyle. In that you want to make sure that you get closer to Him. So you are preserving your daily prayers. You are adding some sunnah as the Prophet did. You are in the remembrance as the Prophet when he woke up, when he ate, when he went to the bathroom, when he came out, when he got into his vehicle, whenever he would go here and when he would do X, Y, and Z, always the Prophet ﷺ is in the remembrance of God. So then after that, now once you're close to God, now you can shine this light we talked about last week. Now you're looking for opportunities that I can help people in need, that I can take care of my family and my neighbors, that I can find the orphans and the poor and be of service to them, that I can spread that compassionate benevolence to the world around me. Because why? I'm in the service of God, not myself and my personal desires. I'm recognizing that my existence has been blessed abundantly and thoroughly, and the nature of God is giving, compassionate, loving, caring, so I want to be that. So that's why he keeps talking about لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْبُدُونَهُ وَحْدَهُ وَتَعْبَدُونَ بِالصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْمَرْحَمَةِ You will find that as the reality of gratitude that you are helping people and encouraging people to a life of fortitude and perseverance in the service of the Divine which is to spread compassion, love and mercy. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا فإنه هو الغفور الرحيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين It's about to get real we're about to get very serious. So, from a fiqh standpoint, from an Islamic understanding of law, there is a new reality that wasn't too common back in the old days, which is a holiday that is not religious by nature. It's not specific to a religion. Historically in the world, empires and nations would be religious, the emperor religious, and then they'd all have certain customs that are all pretty much rooted directly in the religion specific to that religion and people. So now we have this concept of non-religious holidays. So we would look into those, the things that morally have a decent good message that we can agree with, 
No problem. But that's not really what we came here to talk about. We're told a story of the pilgrims arriving on Plymouth Rock and how they had a big feast with the Wampanoag tribe. There is historical evidence of such a feast after they gathered together and these natives showed them hunting methods and they came out with some food, but there was no designation of a Thanksgiving day at that time. There were various days dedicated as a day of Thanksgiving between that time and November 26, 1789. That was when George Washington, the first president, proclaimed the first nationwide Thanksgiving in celebration as, quote, a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many favors of Almighty God on this land. Thanksgiving was first celebrated by all states as the last Thursday in November 1863 by a proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. His establishment of Thanksgiving was to revive George Washington's idea and to help bring people together after the Civil War. The often untold version of Thanksgiving, or a day of Thanksgiving, is the sad reality that happened in a massacre on May 26, 1637, in which 700 Pequot native people from their tribe in modern-day Connecticut were massacred and burned alive and killed by these so-called Puritans and pilgrims. The next day, the governor of that land in Connecticut said this is now to be made a day of thanksgiving for our victory over these savage people. The fact is that these so-called pilgrims and Puritans have a historical problem with ethnocentrism in which they see themselves superior to all other cultures. This white European ethnocentrism has caused all kinds of oppression and corruption and death and destruction all over the world for the history of mankind. The Europeans who came here to find a new life were in fact not much different than most of you. Eastern migrants, they came here escaping a society that doesn't offer too much, perhaps corruption, with little hope for the average person to flourish and prosper. So they want to go to a place where they feel like they can establish their family, a place to flourish and prosper. The problem is, over the last 400 years, there was a huge genocide that took place of the natives of this land we call America. That was mostly due to the spread of disease in many cases intentionally. Many were massacred through ruthless wars and displacement. When the Europeans arrived here 400 years ago, there were by the vast majority of historians about 10 million native tribal people living in this land. They were the only people, human beings, living here. Today, there are two million, 400 years later. If you can imagine the natural growth of a society, usually it grows much more than two million. 10 million will grow to 20, 30 million over 400 years. What we saw is that there were 10 million, now there are two million. So you do the math. That math is called genocide. The absolute destruction and eradication of a people. And of those two million, those that remain, who still carry their traditional religiosity, are a very small percent. 80-90% have become Christian. Muslims had a caliphate ruling Christians for many, many, many centuries. And the conversion process was a very slow process that had nothing to do with murder or a threat to anybody's life. Till today, there are 30 million Christian Arabs 
with their churches, many of them dating back before the Prophet ﷺ living there. A bigger example, Muslims ruled India for seven centuries with a caliphate ruled by Sharia, by the Islamic law. There are one billion Hindus to testify that Islam as a nation, as a law, as a empire did not force its religion or eradicate the people to whom it came to their land. You're seeing the stark difference. And yet they're telling you, you're the guilty one. You're the threat. We are the only moral truth. I say this, what I'm saying, as a patriotic American Muslim. You have to understand where I'm coming from. Some people still don't get it. Loving your country does not mean agreeing with it in everything. Otherwise, you are not a good citizen. You have to call your country out when it is engaging in oppression and injustice and lies and whitewashing solid facts in order to create a new narrative in the minds of people that is comfortable to them. It is very important for us to recognize this most crucial point of our history. We must not accept the mass brainwashing of the superior white European civilization who came here to bless this land with their civilized presence and often challenged by the savage natives. This is the same narrative coming out of the land now called Israel. And history repeats itself. Some Muslims choose to boycott Thanksgiving as a protest to these aforementioned atrocious contradictions to what America claims to be. For those of us celebrating Thanksgiving, we stick to the later understanding of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln as a means to leverage this to build unity amongst Americans in thanks for all the blessings we do have. And the fact that we are a family of people living here in humanity. This gratitude for what we do have, and respecting that, it means confronting our nation's dark past and its dark present in order to promote a solution and then a healing. What they want is a healing without a solution. They want peace without justice. And that is absolutely irrational and ridiculous. It is ridiculous that this day is taught to our kids in the public school system. I remember it because I'm from Oklahoma, which was the most concentrated native land in the whole country. We were taught that we're celebrating the great, beautiful relationship that the pilgrims of Europe and their native friends here in America had. And they had a feast of Thanksgiving and they loved each other. Kumbaya into the sunset. White picket fences, rainbows, and unicorns. This is ridiculous. And it's systemic. It's written in the books, taught in the schools, and I don't know what teacher or they were educated to get to a point where they could actually teach this nonsense. This is a big fat lie. It would be like Germans. The German society says, okay, let's make a date like maybe the day of Auschwitz. And then we'll celebrate the great relationship we had with our Jewish neighbors and friends. I'm telling you, there's very little difference when you look at it. Ten million, two million. That's eight. They're talking six. These are numbers of facts, and I didn't make these up. These are, I collected them from mainstream history.com stuff. I'm running out of time, but I wanted to finish this. The socio-political reality we live on it requires us to be woke, to be conscious of what's going on in the world around us. It is not surprising to our mindset why the movie Avatar lost to the Hurt Locker. The story of the brave soldiers who were winning the explosive battlefield of Iraq. And why American Sniper was such a big hit in this country with great reviews. I've spoke 
with many Muslims and they're like, Avatar was like some naked aliens running around. What kind of imam would watch that? Bro, I'm telling you, if you watch it, you'll say it was brilliant artistry to depict the dilemma that we have been talking about in this sermon and what is going on right now in the Middle East. Today's immigration ban that they have is just another manifestation of the false fear of propaganda that they did. The savage natives, these brown colored savage natives, we are the pure, peaceful, Christian, white Europeans. This is the attitude that we're being taught. So now they want us to fear these dark-skinned foreigners who pose a threat to the natives of this land. Here is the irony, and I'll conclude with this. The irony is that centuries ago, many centuries ago, the natives of this land were completely right to be fearing the systematic dangers of these Anglo-Dutch European refugees who were the ancestors of these same politicians who are warning us of the dangers of the Muslims who pose nowhere near statistically, factually, the threat that the European ancestors actually did what they really did. This irony is magnitude. It's huge. So while there is no real serious threat coming from Muslims, a very small percentage of a percentage of crazy Muslims who, because of their political confusions and their lack of understanding of religion, have done and do crazy things. We see a historically documented, even more dangerous threat coming from very powerful, mostly white, elitists and people in power, people that are in the most powerful places in our country. My dear brothers and sisters, it is of the utmost importance that we stand up and we be a people of knowledge and understanding and wisdom, and that we build good relationships with people, and that we educate ourselves and our neighbors and our co-workers about the truth, the facts, not conspiracy theories. See, a conspiracy theory makes you invalid when you speak a fact. When you say something that is not a proven fact, agreed upon, and then you say something that's fact, all they can remember is the crazy conspiracy theory you said. You have to be very careful. So we have to realize that when we say black lives matter, or brown lives matter, or Muslim lives matter, there is a big need to say that. Because the reality is, statistics show from the reaction to people that the world does not believe that black and brown lives matter as much as white, Jewish, and Christian lives. Is there a big uproar about Syria, about Myanmar, in the world? Are people like out in the streets? What were they doing when some guy shot up some people wrongly and crazy and terribly in a magazine place in France? People are on the streets everywhere. 30 some white people in a comic book place got shot which was wrong and evil, and we should stand up against that. But whole societies are being destroyed, and the vast majority of the world, it's a side note. It's just the way it is. Sorry. It requires us to be active people of truth, who are because the bottom line is brainwashing and ignorance. So our religion has the solution to this. So Hamilton Kidd, he was a scholar of the Arabic language and Islamic history. He was never a Muslim. He fought in the UK Royal Army in World War I, and he later became a professor of the Arabic language at Oxford University, and later at Harvard he came to America to teach Islamic studies. As a non-Muslim Orientalist, he says in his book, Wither Islam, on page 372, no other society has such a record of success in uniting an equality of status, of opportunity, and endeavor, so many and varied races of mankind, history shows that Islam has the power to reconcile apparently irreconcilable elements of race and tradition. If ever the opposition of the great societies of the East and the West is to be replaced, 
by cooperation, the mediation of Islam is an indispensable condition. Perhaps, my dear brothers and sisters, this is what the powers that be really feel. Ya Allah, we ask you to guide us, forgive us, make us content with you, make us people of knowledge and wisdom, that we may shine your light of truth and justice, that we may be a source of solution and healing in the world around us. Ya Allah, do not allow us to become a heedless people who have forgotten you and your favors. Ya Allah, help us to understand that you are the solution to all of our problems, the message you came with, that you have brought us together as a community and you have facilitated us a place where we may spiritually grow and understand how we can connect to you, which is how we can best connect to the world around us and bring truth and justice to the world through compassion and benevolence. Uh, welcome to the